give them all a round of applause again. Would you do that? Thank you, Pastor Dwayne and, and everyone in the, uh, our praise and worship team and, and really just uh, all the different singers that came to, to bring their offering of worship. Thank you for the presentations team and, and all that uh, you did today. Thank you, everybody upstairs in the back and all around our lights. Uh, how do you like our Christmas lights? Isn't that beautiful? We were going to put the, they have a setting on there where they just go up and down and up and down and you go, oh, 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 like that. It would distract you away from the message, but it's beautiful uh, to come into the, the Christmas season and, and those songs were all so beautiful. Praise the Lord. What beautiful voices. It's good to hear uh, younger voices as well as the older ones. Praise the Lord for their hearts filled with praise for our King. Acts chapter number 2, we have a Christmas version of our Acts 2 project and uh, we're going to remain there and hang out here for a little while and kind of get a capture and fla get a, a capture of flavor of really uh, how God ha would have us to take our next steps and laid out some things last week for you in Acts 2. Well, we're going to use a bit and piece of Acts chapter number 2. Uh, of course, I'll, our message will be... Uh, uh, appropriate to our moment and timing and all that because we uh, we had such a wonderful time of singing and and by the way to be able to come up behind that to be able to preach and teach the Bible is uh, that you, you, you get you going a little bit I might get a little excited I, I just want you to know uh, I never do I know that usually I am just pretty pretty docile but uh, I might get a little excited hey it's Christmas time did you believe that uh, Almost all of this year is gone. There is a few days left, and I won't even say that there's a few days to shop, even though you do have a few. And uh, things are, of course, a little bit different, but plow through the different and make a difference in someone's life. Our passage of Scripture this morning is going to be from Acts 2, and we're going to pick it up in Peter's sermon in verse number 29 here in a little bit. And uh, verse number 29 through 36, we'll see where uh, maybe I went the wrong way. I'm definitely not Megan. She's a lot shorter than I am. But there we go. Christmas convictions. Sometimes I push the wrong button there. Rachel, you and I, we're working good together. Thank you for picking up the old man. But uh, Christmas convictions. What are your convictions? Simple question. Do you have any convictions in your life? What does it mean to have convictions over something? I mean, if you really have convictions over something, then I, I've got to believe that you're going to uh, speak about it maybe somewhere down the road or, or tell somebody about it, but it's really going to start with your belief system. We'll get into that in a little bit, and it should exude out of you. It should be something that is pretty clear, but what does it mean to have convictions over something? Okay, so you think that through a little bit, and then I ask you, what are your personal convictions of Christmas? So you may have some personal convictions. You may have some convictions about the time we live in, the culture, the way that we're being told to do things or not to do things. You might even have some crazy convictions about the way God tells you to be a living sacrifice, to be an offering. Maybe you have some great convictions on a negative side of how, uh, as we have said often, Nobody likes being told what to do, but if you open up the Bible a little bit, God will tell you what to do, and that may be a reason why maybe people just don't pick up the Bible and read it, but I love going into the Bible because God has great convictions. God has some strong convictions about every subject you can think about, so when it comes to Christmas, what are your Christmas convictions? Because when we look at this chapter in Acts 2, we know that it really is a preaching of Easter. But in order to preach Easter, we have to have Christmas first, don't we? When you think of Mary, did you know? Did she know? Did she really know? Emmanuel, God with us, did we really understand that? If we would, we would be transported back there and realize as the angel speaks to the shepherds that you know that God is with us. He's right there, lying there. Hmm. 
So many over the years have missed that. So in your personal Christmas convictions, what have you missed over the years? And what are the convictions that you hold to that are really important? Because convictions very simply mean, as it says up on the cross, uh, up on the cross, up on the, up on the cross, that's not bad, up on the cross, up on the screen, a strong persuasion or belief, a state of mind in which one is free from doubt. When you're really strong about someone, when you something or someone, or, or you really have a belief system that's really on something, you, you can persuade people. But if you're weak in your convictions, then you won't be able to convince anybody of anything. Some people have really strong convictions about a lot of stuff. They're really sure of things. They have a state of mind where they believe that, hey, I am free from doubt over this particular matter. Well, what is it that you in your life really have assuredness over, that you have certainty over, that you're completely convinced that you're principled about things, that you have a resoluteness? To me, Christmas comes for so many people and Christmas convictions, to be really strong in your convictions about the Christmas time, Hopefully it's not about all the toys and all the presents. And uh, I love these commercials that started coming out a few years ago with, you know, uh, the husband or the wife buys the, the spouse a new Lexus. Now, who do you know that's ever done that? Has anybody known anybody? I, I Send me an email about that person. I'd like to give them a call and say, what were you thinking? Now we have the commercial where the person's giving themselves a Lexus for Christmas. I have a strong conviction about that. Send me the money. I'll take care of it for you. But conviction about Christmas time, the act of convincing someone of error on one side, and of course, on the other side, compelling them to know and admit the truth. It says in Acts chapter number 2, verse 40, uh, 42, we looked at this a couple weeks ago, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They continued steadfastly. Those are people that had convictions. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's, to me, strong conviction. That's Paul telling the church at Corinth, you better stay with it. It's saying, I adhere to the one I will be his adherent, I will stick to him really closely, and I'll be devoted or constant to the one. I have strong convictions about who I believe in. So now, why? Why do you have? Why do we have? I know that the word our up there should be our. We determined that in the first service, so in case you hadn't figured that out yet, it took me in for 20 minutes to figure that out, but... Why do our convictions about Jesus Christ matter so much? I believe we have some really strong convictions about some things in our lives. I really believe that we have possibly some convictions in our lives about things that unfortunately are way too strong in one area and not strong enough in another. Many of you are in the medical field. Many of you care for patients. Many of you have seen things that I'll never see. But if anybody's lived on the face of the earth very long, they have exhibited the loss of someone very, very special. I heard a preacher recently say in a, in a preaching message, you ought to learn how to be a good loser because you're going to lose an awful lot in your life before it's done. And the one thing you're going to lose is your life. And people are going to die. People are going to pass away. And I understand how we're really having strong convictions about preserving life and preventing anything from happening. And I get it. But let me just say, this is just free of charge. Look, you want to preserve a life and you want to prevent a life from dying, then listen to Jesus Christ. And then they will never see the second death. They will get the first death, fine. You're all going to get that because I heard it's appointed that a man who wants to die and after this the judgment. Well, you and I ought to get a little bit stronger conviction about the preservation of the soul. 
I'm not quite certain that we've got that. So here's your Christmas convictions coming out of Apostle Peter's mouth. And he's now going to track back to Prophet King Shepherd David. He's going to use Psalm 16. David did, of course, for his speaking about how much he loved the Lord, that he trusted and delighted and had joined the Lord. Because after he was given that 2 Samuel chapter 7 covenant, that forerunning covenant of the Messiah, he wrote about it in so many ways. He wrote it in Psalm 110. He wrote it in Psalm 16. He wrote about this Incredible joy he had over knowing who the Lord Jesus Christ is. So, pick it up with me. Acts chapter number 2, verse number 29. Here's Peter preaching, and he's going to acknowledge prophet David. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both buried, excuse me, both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Verse 30, go ahead and advance it for me, Rachel, go ahead, you're fine, thank you very much. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. You see, this is a complete rehearsal of what was spoken of in prophecy, a messianic psalm by David. And Peter is using this to be part of his preaching sermon at Pentecost. One of the greatest, if not the greatest sermon ever preached besides the Lord Jesus Christ preaching his sermons. And then he says, of course, in verse 32, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. So Peter witnessed this, but David, who's saying that we're witnesses of it, we're looking at, they're going, wow, what did David know? Well, he had a peek into God's beautiful, holy prophecy of what's to come through the covenant that God gave him, Nathan delivered to him. So here we have Peter speaking, relating things to David, and then continuing the message. Watch this, verse 33, therefore... Being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand. David's sepulcher sitting right there in Jerusalem. David's burial place. David's bones still sitting there. But here's Peter preaching, saying, David knew that Jesus Christ and his sepulcher was empty. Jesus Christ is in glory at the right hand of the Father. It says in verse 35, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. What an incredible section of the preaching message of P Apostle Peter at uh, Pentecost and how he delivers something that each one of those people and audience are going, wow. Now we'll see next week when we looked at what happened in result of that preaching. But for now, let's just simply look at a couple of little things here. You see, you and I, looking at this, and understanding by reading it now that we have the Holy Word, we say, oh, Peter's talking to those Jews about what they did to the Lord, the Messiah. They crucified him. But now we're reading it. Aren't you reminded of something that's really, really clear in your own heart? And that's the fact that we all crucified Christ. We crucified him, the Lord and the Christ. We're all guilty by our sin. So this morning, you and I, who have great Christmas convictions over who Jesus Christ is and how Jesus birthed, now Jesus resurrected, Peter again preaches from the cross, excuse me, from the cradle to the cross, obviously to heaven and to glory and to you and I watching this thing play out by reading it, 
I can imagine what it was like for Peter to preach this, the conviction on the faces of those people, but then they responded. And then they had great convictions because Peter had great convictions. You see, the first thing about people with Christmas convictions is that they know why. Why they believe in Jesus Christ. Do you know why you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you? You ought to. Why do you believe in Jesus Christ? Well, the next verse tells us what it is that we clearly hear from the message being preached. And that's, he seeing this, before spake of the resurrection of Christ, David, prophet, speaking, but again, Peter speaking what he spoke, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Do you really believe that? You see, people who have strong convictions about Christmas know why they believe in Jesus. You know why you believe in Jesus? Because he ain't here. He's risen. He is alive. He is the resurrection. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. I believe in that. I remember in a summer's day in July of 1983, I called in the name of the Lord. Sean Summers stood up there and said, I believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That was powerful. As the man said, if I could quote him properly or come close, I've done a lot of things for my salvation's sake, but it maybe was to make the church happy, make other family members, make friends happy, but I really never ever was saved until he called in the name of the Lord. Believed, but he didn't believe. And maybe that's you today. I believe that sounds like a good story. When you believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The resurrection is what you and I believe in, which gives us strong convictions. That's why I believe. That's why you ought to believe in Jesus Christ. He is risen. Okay, so guess what? A lot of people have strong convictions about that. And I praise the Lord for all of you who said, yeah, I've got strong conviction. The gospel's why I believe it. The belief of all of this is the good news that Jesus Christ saves, that Jesus Christ came. He lived a perfect and sinless life. He died a horrible death. He was buried. He rose from the dead on the third day. And so that's the gospel, and I believe, okay, but un unfortunately, a lot of people believe without telling anybody anything. So the second piece of what personal conviction comes in your Christmas time, this Christmas conviction is telling others why they are a Christian. Do you tell people why? I didn't say what, how, when, where. Why are you a Christian? Why do you believe what you believe? Could you please tell me why? Well, I, 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 I just, I just do. I, 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 do you think that argument is going to go very far with anybody who you're trying to convince of your convictions? They'll laugh at you. I don't want to be laughed at. That compelled me days, weeks after I got saved. I needed to know how to tell people what I just believed in. Now, don't you really want to tell people? what you believe and why you believe it you know what the next verse is up there it's a very simple statement this Jesus hath God raised up whereof we all are witnesses hey Peter saw it he was a physical witness but guess what in the spirit you're a witness remember when you got saved Roger Robinette I remember when you got dunked in that tank Probably almost just couldn't get you up out of there. Man, it was all. And you testified of how you believed. And now you've got to tell people. If you don't tell people, if you don't tell people, well, well I believe and I'm good and I'm secure and I'm happy and I'm never going to, I'm going to have eternity with Jesus Christ. Yay. Well, where's your Christmas convictions? Christmas is here. Ringing a bell for Salvation Army is cool. Buying a meal for City Ocean, City, Ocean, City Ocean Mission. 
I might as well get it out the way I was saying it. City, union, mission. It's not a compound word, Brownie, come on. Buying a meal for them would be awesome. Do it. They need help. I get letter after letter every week of good organizations that preach the gospel that don't have anything. And they want to preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Guess what? You don't need anything but a mouth and the word of God in your heart to tell people why you believe what you believe. That's all you need. So go in the power of the Spirit of God, and it'll be life-changing. If you go in your power, there's a good chance that it goes, Pfft. you say, well, the Word of God doesn't return void. I got that, but you better get on the Holy Spirit of God's way of doing things, because that's where the power is. The power is in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ being delivered by someone who's filled with his power and his presence. You wonder why it oftentimes falls on deaf ears, because we don't have conviction over what we're telling people. What's my conviction? Mark Brown, what is your conviction? Because conviction says the act of convincing a person of error or compelling them to the admission of a truth. So it's very simply put. We need to know what we believe and tell why. And then we need to say, okay, excuse me. We need to know why we believe. We need to tell people why we believe it. And then lastly, here it is. Last thought. People with Christmas convictions, you know what? They tell others why, why they live the way they live. And that your life needs to live out why you love Jesus Christ. Is anybody seeing my life? I know that people used to say, well, that was just uh, another way of evangelizing. That was just lifestyle evangelism. I'm not putting something in a can. I'm saying if you live out your strong convictions in Jesus Christ and you walk as a holy person, someone who is refined by the Spirit and by the Word, someone who says, I know what I believe, I know why I believe it. I tell other people what I believe and why I believe it. And now I live like I'm crucified with Christ. You see, you and I, again, we crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. We're the ones who hung him on the cross. We, along with the Jews, hung him on the cross. And what Peter's saying here in his next verse is very, very simple. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye, whom me, crucified, both Lord and Christ. We all crucified him. We're the contributing factor. Our sin he bore. But though your sins were as scarlet in believing on him and repenting of your life and calling on the name of the Lord to save you, they're white as snow. What kind of Christmas conviction do you have when you see that beautiful white snow fall on the ground? Yes. It may have been a mistake that I called it beautiful, but snow is beautiful for a little period of time until it makes you have a car crash and then you don't like it so much. But it's a picture of the beauty of God's healing and God's redemption. When I live in the convictions that I crucified Christ and now that I'm crucified with Christ... We crucified Christ, and now we're crucified with Christ. As Bobby said, it's Romans 6, 4. He knows what he's saying. Buried in the likeness of Christ's death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection, you were born again. And in that moment, you were immersed into God's glory, into God's holiness of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That should bring you Christmas conviction to the point where you tell people, you tell them why you believe what you believe. You live out why you believe what you believe. And you actually remind yourself through the scriptures every day. I am so thankful for you saving my soul. I'm so thankful for you changing my life. I'm so thankful. And so, for that reason, I say, why do our convictions about Jesus Christ matter so much? I'm asking you the same question I asked you 10 minutes ago. Why 
do our convictions about Jesus matter so much? Maybe you will answer that with God this morning. Maybe God's already speaking to you about that. And maybe you have conviction about Jesus Christ and you've never done anything about anything with him. My prayer and hope this morning is that your Christmas convictions lead you to why you believe. They lead you to why you tell somebody what you tell them. And I surely, surely pray and hope that they lead you into a way of life that shows people why you live the way you live. Please bow your heads for a word of prayer. As you bow your heads and you close your eyes in this time of invitation, I pray that you have some Christmas convictions. Our Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray for the congregation of the saints that will be reminded of what it is to be totally and completely convicted by the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. How we crucified him, but now we're crucified in him and we have a new life in Christ. I pray for this invitation time. Get a hold of the hearts of the people that have never believed on Jesus. Maybe, just maybe today will be the day. And those that do believe that maybe they'll have convictions about telling people. Or they'll have con just an incredible conviction this Christmas about how to live for Jesus. I pray your blessing on our invitation in Jesus' name. Please stand.